Welcome to the Day One Friday. My name is Michael Schimke. I'm the CEO of Scafery. Um, we run this session here every Friday, 11 o'clock uh, Central European Standard Time, um, to allow you, the public, um, to ask uh, questions about Data Vault, um, cloud computing, big data, anything relevant, anything data driven, uh, essentially, is, is of interest here. Um, if you, you can, yeah, you can ask your question here in the chat using the QA section in the client, and also um, just uh, raise your hand. Um, I, mean, I mean, I won't see you if you're raising your hand, you have to do it virtually in the tool century. And then um, there's also a form I'll show you after today's session uh, where you can also um, submit the questions over the week and then we pick them up. Um, uh, we might pick them up in a day on Friday session. Um, if you receive multiple questions, we are, I would say cherry pick and it's time box roughly 10, 15 minutes. Um, yeah, for a good YouTube video essentially. Um, yeah, if there's no questions at all, I either talk about the cluster. We didn't. We did some progress actually, but um, not something that I could show you. Um, instead, what I would like to do today, because we didn't receive a question at the moment, so um, I would like to talk about um, one of my favorite topics in Data Vault, which is um, managed Census BI. Um, and we had one session uh, a while ago. Essentially, it, it, it I think it uh, was uh, well appreciated. Essentially, so let's go back to the topic again. Let me just share my screen here. And yeah, I want to talk about the user space in, um, in managed sets behind. Last time when we picked up one of these questions, we talked about the general architecture. I think we talked a bit briefly at least about the user spaces, um, but there's a couple of more topics around managed sets behind, which we teach in the training, in the bootcamp training uh, to some extent. But then from our practice, we also have some, let's say, additions or extensions to what we teach in pre Um All right, so first of all, the user space. Let's talk about that one first. And let me draw this up. All right, so from the architecture, we know, let's say we got um, the basic architecture here. We got uh, some source systems. Whatever. I'm not a good drawer. So um, we got some staging area, typically some uh, day lake these days. Go to the microphone door. Uh, we got the staging area. Then we have the, the raw data vault. And I should make, leave some space here, right? I think. The business vault, the information lines. That's all we produce essentially from a data vault perspective. Um, th these are the standardized reports that we build essentially. And then the user, the power user or data scientists, they also get the user space. So typically a schema, um, a schema in the, in, on the same platform where you build the rest of the enterprise data which means that the user space first and foremost, if you distribute your enterprise data was across multiple environments, um, I would expect the user space on all these environments. So let's say you have a data lake on S3. If I'm a power user with you in your enterprise data loss, I might need to analyze binary data or semi-structured data maybe, or some other unstructured data. And in this case, I don't want to load that binary data, whatever it is, into your relational database. So I, I want to use a S3 data lake, essentially some, some key, some folder or some bucket uh, on S3 or, or on uh, Azure data storage, uh, the, the blob storage, or on HFS and so on. So just make sure I can upload binary documents or any documents of, uh, of any kind of, uh, of data type. Um, that's number one. And if you have a relational aspect, let's say a Snowflake database, I would expect a schema or database on that platform as well. So every platform environment you use for building an enterprise database should have the capability of creating user spaces. Um, yeah. That's just number one. So the use space might exist in every component of your enterprise data loss. Next thing is, um, in the user space, it, once I have my own, let's say, database or key on, on S3, I could then upload my own data. This we upload external data, right? Which is out of um, uh, out of your knowledge sometimes. And then I would also create my own solutions. I might create additional tables where where I, where I copy data from the enterprise data loss from up here, essentially. 
from up here into my user space. I can upload my external data and then I could, I could create views, maybe um, creating views for um, uh, processing data. And my final product in the user space would be some, let's say, output tables. We call these a user mod. In the best case, some star schema, right? Some snowflake schema or whatever. Maybe in the, in the very best case, your power users are also creating um, data vault structures in the in the other areas. So you would, ex in the best case, you would expect hubs, links, satellites down here. But I've never seen this except at scale free. Sometimes uh, we see these glimpses of of data vault structures in the user space. But it's it's very uh, seldom at customers, and even in, the, in our internal case, it's not very uh, common. So typically in the user space. In my user space, you won't see any hubs in satellites, to be honest. Maybe a reference table, that's it. Um, at least at the moment, I, I wouldn't say um, in the long term. But typically, uh, you, these users do whatever they like. They upload some data into some tables. They process the data. And in best case, they come up with, and it's easy to teach, come up with some user map, some interface, maybe a view layer that they use to pop the data into the target. Maybe some uh, dashboard tool, maybe some Python scripting, R scripting, data mining tools, and so on. Um, that's what I would teach them. Have some output output layer essentially. The the cool thing about the user space is, it sounds crazy that you can just upload external data, but they if if they don't have any capability of doing so, they will find a way of getting this external data into the report. And it's better that because I mean the best option would be if the external data goes via staging into the raw data vault at least. But you're too slow for that, so you don't have enough resources. You don't have time for them. So that's why they need to find a solution. And they have two options now. Either they, you allow them to upload the data into the user space, or they will upload it directly into the dashboarding tool or Excel and so on. If they upload the data into the user space, the advantage is you know about it. You can monitor it. You can limit the storage capabilities to some extent, and so on. So it becomes transparent what they do. And that's the advantage. That's why we allow it. Um, all right. You would, I mean, they can copy data from, from the raw data vault, from the business vault, or from the information map. That's all available here. Well, all the information maps actually. But this, yeah, this one, uh, everything is available to them to query. And in the worst case, they would create tables in user space and copy the data from the enterprise data vault into, um, into the user space, creating redundant data. Not nice. But that's what it is, right? So that's what I do when they don't know what the view is, for example. So what we typically do is on the user space, we limit the storage you can consume as a power user. And when you call, call us up, typically there's a support hotline at clients where a power user can call up the data warehouse team and typically they ask for more storage because it's an easy solution, right? Well, um, the limit, I don't know, depends on your overall data volume, um, how much um, storage you want to um, re reserve or prove, uh, um, uh, provide to a, a power user. But once they call up, instead of giving them more storage, you send somebody over to the desk and help them to uh, virtualize their solutions, creating views instead of tables, essentially, um, for all the reasons. Less storage consumption, you don't have to maintain the load, um, you don't have to make sure, maintain GDPR issues, right? When, when we delete data up here in the raw data vault, it will be deleted or removed from your user space as well. You don't have to manage anything, right? If you copy data, you have to make sure that the, the person data gets removed from the user space. We won't do that. So there's a lot of reasons, a lot of advantages for the power users to use views instead of tables. It's always up to date, the kind of stuff, right? So that's a user space, um, that's a views. And um, in the best case, you, they create a user mod for the output layer. When they do that, you're very close to the design of the data vault. So you got some some business vault logic here, maybe some incoming raw data, that's what it is. Um, and the user map is very close to the information map. So you can, it's, it's easier to industrialize the solution later on. The nestization we talk about next time, one of the next times, um, but it's the idea for the user space. Now, we have some variations though um, of the user space. So the user space, first of all, is on production. And we don't have that on development environment, test environment, and so on, it's just on production, why? Well, your power users and even your data scientists, they don't develop, uh, uh, let's, they don't have an Excel sheet in, in, for production and testing and development or something, right? They have one Excel sheet and they hotfix everything, right? So that's number one. 
asking them to go via uh, development, test, and production takes too long. They will find another solution. Um, that's number one. So there's only one user space in production, and they use that for wrangling data one way or the other. You can think about version, versioning the user space and so on. There might be some options in the database technology if you want to versionize the user space or do some backups and so on, so they can restore maybe some the old some of the old tables, just like an Excel sheet. If I would do this in Excel, I would create Excel versions all the time, right? Um, that's that's what I would work with. So you can think about this one as well in the user space. The um, the thing is, the user space, the way it is in, in production, is intended for small ad hoc solutions. So if I want to, let's say, wrangle some data in the way I used to use space at Scafree, I upload some data from somewhere because I need some SQL capabilities because I'm good in SQL. So I want to want to wrangle the data in SQL. And then I'm once I'm done with that, I'm offloading it to a next, next tool, maybe some data mining tool, maybe to Salesforce and so on. So that's how I use the, the user space a lot, just to, for bringing some data because I need some relational technology, essentially. And um, I, I create, I don't create dashboards, for example. Dashboards we create in the enterprise data team internally. Those dashboards I'm using, and um, but it's really for ad hoc users, essentially. We have other users where they create dashboards because we don't have time for them. Christoph, the other CEO, uh, we don't have time for him creating his dashboards. So uh, that's what this is. is. So he creates them on uh, by himself with some um, tools section. So that, that's the idea section. Um, so it's very ad hoc, very limited in scope. Um, so typically it's for only a few people, maybe for you, you yourself, maybe for you and your small team. Um, it shouldn't, these solutions in the user space shouldn't, you, you can grant access to them. So you're responsible for it, right? So you just grant table access, but then they, they should not be used by hundreds of users. Or maybe the CEO, right? So once the impact becomes too large, we need to uh, take a look at um, um, industrializing, industrializing those solutions. Now, at some clients, they also have shadow IT, right? And um, what we, the way we use managed Salesforce BI, is to also drag the shadow IT out of the um, out of the shadow. And the way it works is that we define. Well, first of all, we say, well, you can use any consulting firm coming in, they can build some reporting solution on the on, on the enterprise data warehouse. Don't, but don't build this on in the shadows on some different infrastructure or anything else, right? So use the infrastructure we provide to you. And however, if a solution is intended to be used for more than just a few people, if it's foreseeable that there's a higher impact from the onset, but you want to build this by yourself anyway. In this case, or with the other consulting firm, whatever. In this case, um, we provide them a what we call team space or department space sometimes, or solution space. I mean, there's, there's a clear name for that. But this solution space is on all the environments, on development, testing, and production. And the the, the rules, how you use those um, solution spaces, are more um, them there's are more regulated. Let's say. Um, so there's some regulations of that, that you have to deploy your solution, for example, from development to test to production, for example, um, that you might have to follow some um, development standards. For example, we have naming conventions. I would expect that you actually develop data vault there, if possible, right? That you follow some naming convention, maybe. That you follow some auditing guidelines, security guidelines, privacy guidelines, and so on that you use as much data as possible from the raw data vault. And if the data is not available and we can't produce it for you, well, then you have to load it directly into your solution space, but then follow all the other guidelines, right? How we deal with privacy data and so on. Or maybe just wait for us delivering you the raw data via the raw data vault. Um, so these solution spaces are for bigger solutions built by departments by themselves with or without some consulting firm or some external partner. Um, but because of the higher impact from the onset, we ask them to um, essentially uh, follow more development practices that we that we standardized on in the data warehouse team essentially. That's the idea. Um, that gives, it gives them some more capabilities with the user space, or with this managed services BI concept, right? Without uh, losing too many, um, without relaxing too many of the development standards we require for the enterprise data warehouse, because it's higher quality, yet, right? Um, yeah, that's what we do with, with a couple of clients actually. Where they uh, they use managed service BI with 
um, uh, with larger setups, essentially. That's the idea. Um, all right. That's the idea. Cool. That's the user space. So we, we, we have user spaces for ad hoc solutions, solution spaces for or team spaces for larger solutions with higher impact from the onset. Um, next time, um, I want to talk about the industrialization from the user space down here into the enterprise data warehouse. When you realize, well, this ad hoc solution became bigger than expected, for sure. Now the CEO is, is using the solution and maybe hundreds of users. Then you need to think about this, actually. But then we need to also talk about monitoring. How do you identify that fact that a solution become, became bigger than expected, right? Those two topics I want to discuss next time. Um, yeah, cool. Um, if you have a question. So I'm done for the day. If you have a question like the, like this, when this is a bit made up, right? Because I want to talk about it. Um, let me just share my screen again. Um, yeah, use this form here. HTTPS sfr.ee slash DB Friday. Uh, upload your question there. Upload images if you want from whiteboards or from your team, whatever. And um, I'll, uh, yeah, I'll pick it up, pick it up in the next, one of the next sessions, essentially. And um, yeah, hope you enjoyed today. Hope you enjoyed the uh, Managed Service BI series I'm working on at the moment, right? For the next uh, 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 weeks. And um, yeah, wish you a nice weekend. We have snow here in, in Northern Germany. So um, it becomes an interesting weekend, but um, yeah, it's cool. So see you next time. See you next Friday and enjoy. Thank you guys. Bye-bye. Thanks for joining today. If you'd like to discuss this further, give us a call on the number below here and we have to discuss this with you. See you next time. Have a nice weekend. Bye-bye.